Okay, now welcome everybody. This is the GEO session on the Handbook of Labor, Human Resources and Population Economics um, program. Um, well, uh, I'm the editor together with a large number of section editors of this long-term project. The idea is uh, to collect about 600 chapters of uh, living nature uh, over time, uh, which can be uh, updated, but also are part or should be part uh, of uh, the debate about the development in various areas of uh, the topic. Um, and we are doing these kind of presentations uh, since since a while with uh, uh, either focused topics or with uh, freshly uh, published or nearly soon forthcoming chapters. So the section, so the set of papers today um, are from uh, from re recently just uh, recently published either published or in production papers up to those who are there in a few moments so to speak and uh, we use these kind of presentations also to update our knowledge uh, what is necessary and uh, to change and and so on so um now um we have as i said six uh, uh, chapters uh, every presenter has about uh, 10 or so minutes uh, for presentation and then we have we have time for for discussions so uh, the first speaker uh, is uh, is Qing uh, Pei from Education University of Hong Kong and he will take a very broad historical approach and uh, talk to us about climate change in historical perspective violence conflict uh, and migration so Qing please please start Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Raquel. Thank you so much. And uh, let me, sh yes, let me share my screen first. Yes. This is the, you know, uh, good, uh, I mean, I think it's good afternoon, right? And some of the speakers should be, you know, good evening, right? Be due to the time zone. And uh, uh, my presentation topic is climate change in historical perspective, violence, conflict, and uh, migration. I'm Qing Pei, right, from Education University of Hong Kong. And try to embrace, right? This is the content of my presentation, a background, research questions, methodology, discussion, and some of the reference. For the you know, climate change and in the historical perspective, actually, uh, last year, right, I enjoyed a research project and uh, we developed and invent a concept that is the history of climate and society. And this paper published in Nature in 2021, that is the last year. And actually, you know, I involved in this project and to work with a group of scholars from different disciplines, archaeology, geography, history, paleoclimatology, and so on and so on. And there is no concept. Actually, we would like to see how climate and the society they interact with each other. That means we would like to provide some historical reference, right, to see, okay, how the society or social responses, you know, under the climate impacts, right, in the past, and the, these kind of social response and the social experience, right, in the past, whether we can use these you no know, reference, right, to understand our future climate you know, impacts, right, of the warming trend. So this is the you know our project. So for my presentation, I will also follow the concepts of history of climate and society under this umbrella, and then to discuss about the climate change and the migration, violence, and the conflicts. And uh, for the you know, history or for the historical studies, usually we need to consider the you know, so-called archival society because for the historical society or historical studies, we usually need to consider how we can find the empirical evidence. And uh, if we understand or if we check the advantages of those archive societies, that is historical documents or those records, you know, Europe and China are the major two centers right, in the world with a uh, you know, very good you know, uh, advantage right, in terms of the archive society. And then besides that, right, for these two you know, regions, right, China and Europe, this is also the major you know, center for the population right, in the past. So therefore, right, for my chapters, I mainly discussed right, the linkage between climate change and the migration and the violence right, in terms of the Europe context and the Chinese context. 
But for my studies, you know, or for the presentation today, I would like to focus more on China because uh, I did a lot of the uh, so-called research, right, initiative research, right, on China. And for the European studies, actually, I mainly based on the literature review, right, in this chapter. But for my own research or some original research, actually, you now China is my study area. So therefore, I would like to discuss some about uh, some of the you know uh, evidence, right, directly made by me, right, in the past year. And if we discuss about the historical China, right, from the macro view, right, China could. Uh, considered to be divided into two regions, right? Pastoral region and uh, uh, agricultural region. That means, right, in the pastoral region, we have the nomads there. And for the agricultural region, this is the farmers. And the green line, this is the, the division line, right, between these two regions, roughly. And uh, then, right, along to divide these two lines, right, to these regions. Actually, you know, we have a very famous, right, phenomenon in the world that is so-called the, the Great War. Right, the Great Wall, right, divides two regions. And the, since the first right, dynasty in China, right, the Qin Dynasty, right, in the imperial China, actually, you know, uh, the emperor at that time emphasized the function of the Great Wall. And uh, this is the Great Wall, actually, right? The Great Wall, why we have so many colors of Great Wall? Because this Great Wall, they are constructed in different dynasties. And the different color means, right, the Great Wall of different dynasties. And the why the Great War is not only one, it's there are several because the regions of the pastoral society and the agricultural society, they have a buffering zone, like show in this you know, dark color. And actually, you know, the Great War, you can see, you know, it goes through this you know, dark color zone. And uh, due to the shift of the climate, this you no know, buffering zone is not a line for sure, right? This is also a zone. That means usually, right? Sometimes, right? The you know, the 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 division line between pastoral society and agricultural society they move south eastward, or sometimes it may move north westward. So therefore, the Great Wall also follow this buffering zone as well. But for this no buffering zone, actually, it also follow the so-called summer monsoon limit, right? This is the modern summer monsoon limit. And we can see that, right, this summer monsoon limit, right, pass through the agriculture and the pastoral the buffering zone, right, this transition area. So in this case, right, we can generally speaking, right, the Great War, it is a political divide, right, between the nomadic society and the agricultural society. It is also a cultural divide, right, because nomads and uh, uh, farmers, they share different cultures. And this is also a climate divide, but uh, this divide never blocked the migration uh, in between, right? And uh, due to we have the migration, we may have the conflicts, right, between the farmers and the nomads. So for the you know, nomads, as you can see, this is some of the background for the nomads, right, in China, and uh, they are, you know, uh, ready to move. And even you can see for their tent, it is easy to carry. If there is any you know, climate you know, impact, they will migrate right, to seek the heat and the water. But uh, for the farmers, it is another story. For the farmers, usually they stay, you know, stick to their land. You know, as you can see, right, this is a you know, picture of land, right? This is taken by me. If they have land, you know, it's a kind of rainbow, right? You can see the rainbow on side, that means if they have land, they will live in the heaven. So for the farmers, right, they prefer to have a stable life, right? Even we have the climate change, right? Farmers still prefer to, you know, stay in their ancestors, right, land. So in, you know, in the farmer society, therefore we have no kind of religion, right, in terms of the earth. And then, you know, you can see in Beijing, we have the temple of earth as well. So this is the general background, right, for China. If we want to understand the climate, migration, and violence, we need to understand the two no, major societies in China. And then you know, according to different you know, culture and different responses to climate change, we can see that right, the migration and the climate change will occur and how the conflicts right, along with the migration between these two societies. So for the methodology right, to understand this kind of this phenomenon, right, we have two major you know, uh, methods. 
The first one is based on the narrative one. Just you can see, you know, the book written by you know, Professor Parker, right? This is based on the historical approach. And then some of the researchers nowadays, right, they also prefer to use the you know, quantitative approach, right? Statistical approach, like the, you know, this figure, right? Use the line. And for me, actually, you know, both two you know, methods applied into my you no know, study. And uh, to give a general picture, right? I just want to summarize the major findings and also the questions, right, for the climate migration and the violence, right, in the historical China. And uh, as we know that, right, for the nomadic society, if we have climate change, nomads will migrate and then it will cross the line between the nomadic society and the farmer society. Then we may have the nomads and the farmer conflicts. But for agrarian, agrarian society, it will be a bit different stories. For the climate change itself, we will not trigger the migration of farmers in general, right? But the conflict, it is. So therefore, right, this is the you know, concept model, right, for the agrarian society. And uh, since the nomadic migration usually will cause the conflict with the nomad uh, farmers, so therefore the nomadic migration itself also can cause the farmers migration as well. And the, from the climate change to the conflicts, and the, finally it may lead the geopolitical cycles because when we have the nomads and the farmers conflicts, right? That means you know, which one, which side is even, is more stronger, that is much stronger. To China and then occupy the whole China, right, sometimes. So then we say it's a kind of geopolitical change for the you know, Imperial China. And if the farmers is stronger, then they will beat the nomads. Then they still occupy the central China and uh, to, the, uh, to keep you know, Imperial China under the control of farmers. So this is also the geopolitical cycle. So from climate change, right, we can understand the migration. We can understand the conflicts between farmers and nomads. And furthermore, we can understand the geopolitical cycles right, in Imperial China. So this is the major findings and the, also the major questions. And uh, for the methodology, right further, as I just would like to you know, go quickly, because this is some of the details, for example, how I translate my right, Chinese records right, into the data. And the, what is the major data source right, for my uh, studies? And then besides that, right, just to summarize the you know, records numbers, right? For example, the uh, nomads, uh, nomadic migration records, farmers' my records, and also the conflicts, right, in between, and so on and so forth. And the for the you know, uh, research methods, right? These are three major research methods I have used, right, for the statistical approach. And the, for the narrative approach, right, this is the traditional one right, used by historians. And the, here is the uh, data right for the first part of the conceptual model right to uh, in terms of the nomadic society and uh, then right we know that the nomadic migration right not only this is a response to climate change but also it uh, affected the chinese history a lot right as you can see this star is beijing right in the 19 uh, in the 1449 this year right the nomadic migration right crossed the you know, Great War, right, marked in the you know, dark line, right, this is the Great War, and uh, then occupied Beijing, and this event, we call it as a Tumu Christ, and uh, this poor guy, right, this is the uh, Yong, uh, Yin Zhonghuang uh, Emperor, right, now, <clears throat> he was captured, right, by the nomads, right, this is a kind of the, you know, misery, right, you know, for the farmer's history, Right, but uh, according to you know, these you know, uh, records or these events, we can see that right, the nomadic migrations right, and the climate change right, affect you know, Chinese history a lot. And also sometimes you know, farmers right, fight back right, to beat right, the nomads and uh, reoccupy those lands, right, those lands. So this is the, you know, uh, to, this is the, the you know, perspective of climate change to understand the you know, historical ch China. And this is for the agrarian society. Again, right, we can see the data here and uh, use this data. We prove this you know, conceptual model. And uh, this is the, you know, another conceptual model right, based on the data. And uh, finally, this is about the climate change conflicts and geopolitical cycle. So here is the data. 
And uh, according to the you know, climate change, right, migration and the con uh, conflicts, sometimes right, we know that right, migration, right, we always say migration is a kind of you know, adaptation right, to climate change, right? especially for nomadic societies. If we check nomadic society, the major adaptation for climate change is migration. And uh, however, the point is their migration maybe is good for nomadic society itself, but it may have some externality to the farmer society. As you can see, you know, this is the Mongolian invasion or the Manchuria invasion or conquest of Manchuria. So this is the kind of you know, side effects of migration as a kind of major adaptation for the nomadic societies. So according to the climate change, migration and the conflicts, right, this study, I would like to read some of the questions right, for us to consider further. That means you know, whether we need to consider the cultural difference in the adaptation, whether we need to consider the fairness of the adaptation. Maybe for one society, it is good, but it may have some side effects for another society. So we may need to consider the cost of adaptation. And how about else, something else, right? So for the adaptation for these you know, words, right? We may consider more, right? Under you know, based on the studies of climate change, migration, and the conflicts. And uh, besides that, I would like to you know, uh, promote another of my projects, right? Because you know, in my project, I mainly use the archival society to understand past climate change and uh, related the social response. So now I join uh, you know, another project, right? This is called Pages, right? Past climate change. Right? In this you know, project, we mainly study the archives and how to utilize the archives, right? To understand the climate and the society right, in history. Okay, finally, now we are you know, standing here, right? This is the you know, uh, uh, picture right, to show our you know, kind of scenarios of climate change. And we are standing here. And under the you know, more and more, you know, my, uh, uh, how's it, more, more and more serious impacts of global warming, we may have more and more adaptations and more and more migrations. And um, sometimes, unfortunately, we may have more and more conflicts. So how we can view our future, right? how we can view our future. According to the studies of China, we find that the walls can never stop the migration and the walls can never stop the you know, conflicts as well. So we may need to find some other approach right, to avoid the conflicts and to avoid the walls as well. So maybe we need to consider the cooperation, but not the isolation. Right, so this is the some of the uh, implication from the past right, to our future you know, uh, human society. So this is the reference right in my you know, presentation. And if you are interested in my presentation and my work, right here is the papers right you know I have published. Thank you so much. Okay, okay, thank you so much, right everyone. Okay, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now. Um, this is a historical presentation, but uh, there's lots of uh, a challenge uh, for for today's life. Uh, Johanna, you have a question? Is this no? I, I just saw your hands rising. Okay. Now, uh, my hey, my point you. is exactly exactly uh, going. Uh, if you have no other remarks, I would like to have at least one. Uh, uh, in a way, I like your your finding, <laughs> but this means uh, does this mean um, uh, does that conclusions uh, from history for the climate change crisis we are facing uh, are not very deep? Uh, besides, of walls don't help. I mean, I I I think this is a general. Uh, thing because reality shows uh, the number of walls between countries uh, is dramatically increasing over the last uh, decades. Yes, across the world, we have more walls between countries, not less. Um, uh, and uh, also, uh, forget about all the other crises we have at the moment. Uh, we, uh, we we see that globalization uh, is on decline. Yes, uh, in in a, in a way. So that's co the, the cooperation would would mean that we use globalization. So is it that we will not learn from history? Is this what you are saying? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yes, this is the uh, very good questions and a very you know, uh, insightful perspective, right? To understand the you know, past climate change. And uh, for me, right, when we understand the past climate change, usually we treat the 
past climate change as a major indicator of the resource. And how we can you know, understand the societies, right? You know, under these you know, resource you know, conflicts and challenges, right? This is something we need to bear in mind and need to find the relevant answer, right? From our past you know, uh, experiences. And uh, for the you know, globalization, right? This is the one of the you know, solutions, right? To deal with the you know, uh, resource you know, shortcomings because usually when we have the you know, climate change, Right, it does not have the you know, same, the same impact right, to all the regions or all the places. So some of the regions may have smaller impact, some of the places may have the bigger. So at this moment, globalization or cooperation can balance the resource from one region to another region. So this could be one of the solution right, to tackle with the future climate change. So therefore I raise the importance of cooperation, but not the conflicts or isolation. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, the burden, I think, uh, just as this is more political than academic, but the burden we have in our generation is that un uh, unlike in history, we have a, maybe some marginal, but a small change uh, to, to avoid uh, further climate uh, uh, change, yes, at least to, to moderate it uh, for uh, in, in the middle term future. So I think this, this kind of historical experiences are very important. Uh, uh, that's why. I'm very grateful for your presentation. Now, let's move on. Thank, Thank you. you very much. You. If there is no urgent other question, we are out of time. We move further to Shihi Fu from Shameng University. And uh, while well, he jumps to a very different topic, but still somehow related, it's about regional issues, labor market, agglomeration, economies. Please, Shihi, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Zimmerman, for the invitation very much. And also, it's a great pleasure to join this session. Um, so this chapter is about um, a, a topic uh, spanning both urban economics and labor economics. Uh, I'm going to present these uh, uh, contents. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the concepts and also introduce the uh, micro foundation and the empirical evidence for uh, labor market agglomeration economies. And, and also uh, discuss, uh, summarize the causal uh, identification, uh, uh, identification strategies uh, in those empirical studies to estimate the labor um, uh, market uh, uh, economic economies. And finally, I just um, summarize and um, uh, point out the future uh, of research uh, direction. Uh, because of this topic probably is a little bit new to labor economists. So I'm, I'm going to spend a little bit more time to uh, introduce the concepts. So um, the concept actually is originated from uh, um, the business agglomeration economists in uh, regional and urban economics. Um, because we consider cities as uh, an area with high population density. So, so basically cities are concentration of people and firms. So uh, when people and firms that concentrate together, co-located together, um, they generate some benefits. Otherwise, people uh, would not uh, co-located together. So such kind of benefits are uh, called uh, uh, agglomeration economies. Uh, but in the traditional regional and urban economics, uh, this uh, benefits is mainly referred to how firms benefit from other firms nearby. So in this sense, we call this a business accommodation economies. And, and this concept is very important in urban economics because um, this uh, type of uh, accommodation economies is the fundamental reason why we have cities. Um, traditionally, there are two types of business accommodation economies. Uh, one is called localization economies, another is called urbanization economies. Uh, to, uh, um, uh, uh, put it in a different way, um, uh, in a very uh, uh, in, in intuitive way, uh, localization economies just mean uh, a firm can benefit from other firms um, uh, uh, in the same industry in the city. So, so basically, this is a, a kind of like a same industry uh, uh, spillover effects. Uh, urbanization economies is uh, uh, on the other side. Um, it's the benefit from the concentration of different firms in different industries in the city. So it's the uh, externalities uh, 
uh, cross industry, cross firms, but within a city. So it's related to the uh, city size. And uh, why? Uh, and and uh, what causes this uh, localization and urbanization economies? Uh, there are many, many studies. Uh, there are many theoretical models, but also many empirical evidence. Um, to uh, briefly summarize them. So when the firms that are located together, they can share some inputs. Um, and, and when the, the inputs uh, has a scale economies, then sharing the inputs can reduce the cost. So the shared inputs generates these um, uh, externalities. And second is the level of the pooling. So uh, when the, uh, there are many uh, workers and firms uh, in the uh, labor markets, so the matching quality will be uh, better. And also the friction on unemployment rate will be lower. And, and also when the works that interact with each other and also firms interact with each other, uh, they can uh, generate all kinds of uh, information and knowledge spillovers. So this is a uh, learning externalities. And certainly uh, uh, the concentration of the same industry firms in the location uh, is kind of like the uh, uh, specialization um, uh, of the uh, uh, industry. So specialization can also generate um, uh, external economies. So, and also uh, when the uh, firms of the same industry collocated together, uh, firms we are compete uh, against each other. So such kind of uh, uh, competition pressure may uh, give firms incentive to to innovate. So this also generates some uh, positive uh, uh, externalities. So uh, all these channels can explain why firms can benefit from other firms nearby. Uh, but these are look at the uh, externalities in the state in the static context. Uh, in the dynamic context. Uh, when uh, the firms in the same industry collocate together uh, because they generate such kind of benefits. So in the long run, uh, firms in this industry can grow faster, so which will cause this industry to, uh, to grow faster. So in this dynamic context, uh, this uh, localization economy is called uh, Marshalling Aero Roma Externalities. Uh, this is from a uh, paper by uh, uh, a Harvard professor, uh, uh, Edward Glazer. So for urbanization economies, uh, the concept has changed over time, but basically uh, it means firms can benefit from other firms co-located in the same city and also from firm, uh, benefit from firms from different industries. So, so basically urbanization economies come from both the scale, uh, the size of the city and also the diversity of the industries in the city. And the channels is pretty much uh, similar to to uh, the channels for uh, localization economies, but there is one uh, very di uh, big difference. So, um, in <coughs> because if in a city there are many uh, different industry firms collocated together, so uh, firms can interact with other firms from different industries. So, such kind of cross industry fertilization uh, can promote innovation. So, uh, uh, a very famous scholar, Jan Jacobs. Uh, she published a few books, and one of her famous idea is that um, uh, industry diversity uh, within a city can promote innovation and, and urban growth. So uh, in this dynamic context, uh, the dynamic urbanization in Columbus is called Jan Jacobs Exnantis. Okay? So uh, that's all for uh, business agglomeration in Columbus. But for uh, labor market agglomeration uh, uh, economies, we just borrow the concepts from um, urban economics. So we just look at the labor market side. So basically, uh, a worker can benefit other works co-located together. So we can also classify such kind of benefits into two types. One is the uh, labor market localization economies. So this means uh, a worker can benefit benefits from the concentration of other works in the same industry or the same occupation. Uh, for, for example, a computer engineer can benefit more from other uh, computer en uh, engineers in Silicon Valley. Um, similarly, uh, labor market urbanization economies means a work can benefit from the concentration of workers in different industries uh, and different uh, occupations. So, so basically the diversity of the labor uh, force can also generate some scale economies. 
So, um, so land market accumulation economics is basically the other side of uh, uh, urban uh, accumulation economics. So tradi traditionally, the urban economics look at the firm side, but the labor uh, uh, economics look at the labor market side. So uh, I guess this is the uh, uh, simple uh, definition of the uh, labor market uh, accumulation economics. So for the micro foundation, there are many uh, studies that are uh, scattered into different journals. So uh, I classify them into three types. Uh, one is the labor market pool effects. So when the labor market is dense, the, uh, when there are many workers concentrated in the uh, local area, so this can uh, reduce the search friction, can reduce the unemployment duration, and increase the matching quality between works and jobs. So the, uh, this effect is also called a sick labor market effect. Okay. Uh, the second channel is human capital externalities. So people can learn from each other when they work together. So uh, there are uh, actually quite a, uh, a lot of studies about uh, try, uh, try to quantify these uh, human capital externalities. Um, sometimes it's also called uh, knowledge spillovers. And uh, networking, uh, this is also uh, a channel because uh, when people are close to each other, there are more chances for people to develop connections and to socialize with, with each other. And such kind of uh, social networking can generate a lot of uh, effects uh, uh, that uh, can affect the labor market outcome. Uh, for example, um, <coughs> sorry, um, if you have strong social networkers, uh, uh, people in, uh, in your social network can help you to get better information and resources to find jobs, to, to uh, match with the job, and also to uh, 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 facilitate innovation. So such, uh, such kind of network uh, effect is also very important in the local labor market area. Uh, there uh, might be other channels, but for the time being, uh, I just summarized them into these three types. Um, there are many empirical studies try to estimate uh, the existence, the uh, magnitude of labor market agglomeration economies. Uh, I classified this uh, empirical uh, literature into five types. Um, the first is to estimate the city size wage premium, and the second uh, is to estimate the, to test the labor market pool effects, and the third is testing the human capital externalities. And uh, the fourth is to test the Marshallian externalities in the labor markets. And also, uh, a very interesting feature of the urban labor markets is that such kind of benefits actually uh, changes over distance. So, um, uh, there are studies that also try to estimate the spatial decay effects uh, for such kind of benefits. Uh, I think the handbook had another chapter called City Size Wage Premium, actually. So uh, I'm going to just um, briefly uh, explain this idea. So, so basically this topic is about uh, this question, why do cities pay more uh, compared with the rural area? Or why do big cities pay more uh, compared with uh, smaller cities? Um, th there are many, many studies actually. Um, so in general, people do find that uh, big cities tend to pay more. Uh, but the reason is not very clear. Uh, there could be many different stories. Uh, there is one um, a nice paper, uh, yet yeah, um, uh, this uh, uh, author, um, uh, Yano, he published a paper in Journal for Open Economics. He basically tested uh, five different uh, uh, competing theories. And uh, eventually he found that even though if you look at the raw data, big cities pay, uh, maybe 20% uh, more uh, of the wages, but two thirds is due to sorting, meaning that it's those high ability workers, high, uh, highly productive workers that move to big cities. But still there are one third of this premium uh, is, uh, is due to the benefits of uh, agglomeration economies. For labor market reporting, uh, uh, there are not many studies, but there are some uh, showing up. Uh, basically, this strands of literature try to test uh, whether labor market thickness uh, can promote labor division and specialization, uh, can reduce search friction, 
can facilitate job turnover and uh, whether uh, the labor market thickness can improve matching quality. Uh, I just uh, want to give you one example. Uh, uh, this paper using the German data, they found that employment density uh, can uh, reduce uh, mismatch. Um, the mismatch meaning uh, people could be uh, 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 matched, uh, mismatched with uh, the education um, uh, attainment, uh, like uh, a college degree may be uh, matched with a job which will require only a high school degree. Um, another mismatch is horizontal, which means uh, a computer worker may be matched with a job which does not require a computer skill. So they found that uh, high employment density area can reduce both types of mismatch. Uh, human cap uh, capital externalities, there are many studies. Uh, the typical uh, empirical evidence is to try to see uh, in cities if the average education of the population increased by 1%, I mean, the share of the uh, uh, educated works increased by 1%, then how much uh, an individual wage can increase. Uh, in general, people found that that is a positive human capital uh, externalities effects. Uh, um, the machining uh, uh, externalities means works benefit from other works in the same industry or the same occupation. Uh, there are some studies uh, showing up now. Uh, I just want to mention this uh, study from Netherlands, uh, doubling the same industry employment in the city uh, can generate uh, like 3% of high uh, wages. So the, uh, the authors did find that in Netherlands, the local labor market has very strong uh, machining uh, externalities. Uh, for the special decay effects, uh, this means uh, it's costly to, for people to interact with other people far away. So such kind of benefits from interacting with other people decay with distance away. Um, uh, I have a paper uh, a few years ago. Uh, I found that the benefits of like uh, noticeable effects uh, decay uh, rapidly beyond three miles from the, the location of the worker. And uh, Rosen and Strange, they also find the same effects using the US census data. So um, uh, this is a very uh, nice feature of the uh, urban labor markets. Um, so uh, the first part, I want to summarize uh, the cost or influence strategies uh, in uh, this uh, strength of empirical uh, studies. So uh, in general, we just uh, estimate the uh, uh, standard wage model. So uh, individual as wage, uh, um, uh, this individual is uh, uh, working in city G. So we control for the standard uh, individual characteristics uh, the, the, the key difference is that we add these uh, urban agglomeration variables to, to the wage model. And this variable could be made by city size, by population or employment density, or by college share in the city. Uh, so uh, in general, we only have uh, cross-sectional data like population census data. So uh, estimated such kind of model, uh, the big challenge is that uh, people have different ability or different preference may choose to move to different cities with different degree of population density or city size. So such kind of special sorting problem uh, is very common in such kind of estimation. So uh, almost all those empirical studies try to find a way to deal with this special sorting problem. Uh, I summarize them in this, uh, I think, four strategy. The first is to use some mayor to proxy for the unobservability. Uh, in the lit literature, people use the uh, armed force qualification test score to measure the inevitability. And uh, you can also use the uh, way people uh, live, uh, the re uh, residential location fixed effect to proxy for uh, those ability because people also sort into different neighborhoods. And the same strategy, if we are fortunate to have the individual panel data, you can just simply include the individual fixed effect. And the third uh, method is uh, very standard, uh, find a good instrument variable. Um, uh, some authors are very creative. Uh, for, for example, uh, Rosenstein and Strange, they use the uh, proportion of land that's are suitable for humans and beings. 
to to instrument for uh, population density. Okay, uh, Moretti used the presence of land ground, ground ecology uh, one century ago to uh, um, add the instrument for college share in the city. And recently, uh, structural models are also introduced in urban uh, economics. So with the structural model, you can deal with all kinds of uh, endogenous variables. So you um, uh, can do a lot of uh, counterfactual analysis. So uh, this is a very different approach, but it's also uh, introduced in this uh, type of studies. And to summarize, uh, uh, I think this is a very active area. There are many new papers coming out uh, because for uh, my, uh, more and more um, individual level microdata are available. Uh, but um, still the existing studies, they only use the data from uh, many from developed countries. They only focus on the city size wage premium. Um, some um, focus on college share, uh, the human capital externalities. And in general, they only focus on the uh, very general urban workers. So uh, uh, there are still many, many uh, new uh, potential uh, research topics um, uh, in this area. Uh, for example, um, we know uh, urban labor market agglomeration economies exist, but we don't know how uh, people interact with, with each other to exchange ideas and, and information. So such kind of channels are still I mean, we don't know much about this. Uh, second, <coughs> uh, different groups of people that may benefit from uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, agglomeration economies differently. Uh, there are some studies talking about like CEOs also benefit the urban labor market uh, agglomeration economies. And also uh, people from uh, people with, with different skills may also benefit from uh, agglomeration economies differently because um to to capture to 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 get the, the knowledge spillover effects you have to have some absorptive capacity and uh so far people only focus on wages uh, as the main outcome variable but there could be other very interesting outcomes like uh, innovation entrepreneurship and also labor supply and also the current pandemic uh, making uh work from home a, a new trend and people are using more and more online interaction. And how does this affect the labor market accommodation economies? Uh, we are not very clear so far. So uh, I think these are all what I want to uh, present. I think uh, not enough time, right? <laughs> so, you can, so if you have any comments, thanks. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you very much. This is uh, very well done in time, uh, Shihi. Now, um, of course, if there are questions from the audience, please uh, either type in the chat or just talk. Just talk. It's the best thing. If not, I mean, at least you mean you mentioned already at the end a bit uh, what will be the future. Uh, in in a way, uh, it's as a long run trend. We all know this uh, that uh, that everybody in the future will live in cities. Yes, basic basically, there's a huge trend upwards. Now the question is, uh, is this uh, avoidable? And this is just coming from efficiency. In a little bit, it looks like that, well, it, it, it pays to live in, in, in big uh, places, yes? But also, uh, on the other hand, we know a lot of negative experiences, yes? So there's wealth, welfare care, um, uh, take up in big cities there in, let's say, in, in developing countries. Uh, lots of people are attracted by, 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 by uh, potential uh, wages, but they are not there if they, if they travel and so on. And in the future, I mean, we all, what we do at the moment, yes, um, 20 years ago, we would have all met in a room, yes, uh, now we can do this, what we are doing. So is this really, is this really the future? Do you see, uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, the future research in that area uh, be driven by, well, the past series or it will be more coming up? Um. Uh, it's a very difficult question. Uh, I know some leading urban economists that are working on, uh, on, on this topic. They have the theoretical models to predict how working from home uh, will change the urban spatial structure. Um, uh, I don't have any answer for this topic, but uh, personally, there are still believe uh, online, I mean, online communication, offline communication. And that, that still could be a substitute, but that, that, that could still be a complement. Um, 
so uh, people still be willing to live together. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, but living together in a dense area, forget about the, 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 the new uh, uh, issue of, uh, let's say, it, being in the internet and, 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 and so technology, but just look at the share of people who are in cities because they are poor, yes? And the others in cities because there's efficiency uh, and, and higher wages and the other have, have maybe nothing. So uh, uh, to what percentage, uh, what, you, what, is, what, is, what is the impression, uh, the real reality is, is, I mean, it looks like agglomeration sounds like uh, it, this is all positive, yes? Um, uh, it's not oh, necessarily I see. the case. Okay. This is not necessarily the case, even nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, so if you would could construct the world differently, uh, this is the best way how we do it. I mean, even I mean, if you if you all, I mean, the, the next uh, presentation will be on well-being. Yes, well, well-being, well-being in, uh, in in big cities. If I, if I live in, live in Tio, uh, uh, Tokyo, uh, there are lots of people around me. Yes, but uh, I'm am I more happy than living somewhere else? Uh, probably not. I'm less. So you are concerned about the how those poor people, low skilled people, uh, can live in big cities? Yeah, well-being is maybe not increasing with big cities. This is what. Um, but the urban economists they have a different view because uh, in big cities we do have uh, a large share for high school workers, but because for them uh, they have high uh, income, the demand for more uh, consumption goods, service goods. So this generates a huge demand for low skilled workers. So in, in this sense, in big cities, low skilled high school works the best their compliments. Okay, okay. I think we have no time. I just wanted to uh, to keep uh, the debate a bit going. So now let's move on. Um, and we are jumping now, Mike, a big ch jump. Uh, um, uh, we, we, keep we come close to China in a sense uh, that uh, Chinese is aging like Europe. Um, so we are concerned about the well-being in old and very old age. This is the topic of uh, Johanna Hartung uh, from University of Bonn. Uh, she is a psychologist by training. That's a different, uh, she brings in a very different view uh, now in, but we are welcoming the handbook as such is very open to various uh, disciplines. So I'm very much welcome her. Uh, and we are all interested to, uh, to hear what she has to say about uh, the topic, please. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present our chapter on well-being in old and very old age. Um, I want to start with the relevance of um, the topic and some important concepts. Then we will examine well-being in old age from three different perspectives. The first perspective um, refers to the question how well-being changes across chronological age. Second, how does well-being change at the end of life? So retrospectively in time before death. Um, the last approach is a concept that is actually coming from economics, um, which deals with the question, how many years of remaining life are spent in well-being as examined with um, cumulative well-being measures. Um, and in the end, a short summary. Global life expectancy has substantially increased over the last centuries, resulting in an increase in the amount and the proportion of older people in population. But do longer lives actually come with the cost of experiencing more years in suffering? or are they accompanied by an increase in happy and satisfied years? Um, before looking at the three different perspectives that ask uh, these questions, some important concepts like what is old age? Um, typically old age or also called third age is tied to retirement, which is in people's mid 60s at the moment shifting to late 60s in industrialized countries. With the increase in life expectancy, people spend increasingly more time in this life phase, which has led to a differentiation within old age. So very old age or the so-called fourth age starts at 85 years. While old age is mostly defined by relative stability, 
um, declines in all kinds of life domains can be recorded in very old age. A short disclaimer at this point, all figures are highly simplified depictions and only for illustrative purposes. Investigating human development, there are three important aspects that need to be taken into account. Firstly, development refers to change across time as people age. Second, the historical context may impact multiple generations simultaneously. For example, recessions or pandemics can cause so-called period effects. Third, we have cohorts. So people who are born in a specific historical time and therefore share a similar socialization and experience specific periods at the same age. Teasing apart these dimensions is widely discussed in um, research and different types of studies allow looking at different kinds of these effects. The focus of the studies reviewed in this chapter is subjective well-being, which is an umbrella term summarizing a number of different operationalizations like life satisfaction, happiness, and ratings of the meaningfulness of life. Importantly, it's always a subjective rating of people's experience. Um, talking about age-related differences in this domain, it must be noted that age itself, indicating the number of years since someone was born, cannot be a causal mechanism. And so change in well-being in old age must be driven by other processes. Nevertheless, we will start with the first perspective of trajectories of well-being over a chronological age. Probably most of you have heard about the well being paradox or the U curve of happiness, but a lot of these studies do not include very old participants or use methods that do not allow for a specific trend in old and very old age, and therefore make predictions of this life phase impossible. The study included in this review focuses specifically on old and very old age. So in a nutshell, there are three potential average well-being trajectories in old age. Stability, which could be based on set point theory, emphasizing stable individual differences. Increase, which would be in line with the U-curve hypothesis and rests upon the idea that people adapt to changing life circumstances. And decrease, um, old age is a time of losses and these losses might accumulate in very old age getting to the limits of adaptive processes. Um, looking at studies investigating these trends, results differ a lot based on the type of well-being we're looking at. Results for life satisfaction are highly mixed. Evidence um, for more effective measures show um, a stability for negative effect, but a decrease for positive effect. And looking at eudaimonic well-being, which is more the purpose of life, meaning of life um, perspective, um, it mostly decreases in an aggregated form. At the beginning, I mentioned that there can be differences between cohorts and periods. These can obscure age effects. So longitudinal panel data, including multiple birth cohorts, can be used to investigate this issue. Unfortunately, this kind of data is rare, but evidence from such studies show that direction and magnitude of period and cohort effects vary across the exact period and cohort we are looking at. But when we control for these effects, evidence clearly points to a decline in well-being from approximately the age of 70. So contrary to the U-shape hypothesis. Um, however, conclusions drawn from this research will be misleading in aging societies across time if well-being patterns in old age differ in the last years of life, because with increasing life expectancy, people um, experience the final years in older and older ages. 
So therefore, um, we looked at a second perspective. This perspective focuses on the last years of life. So looking at time to death instead of chronological age. It assumes that um, changes over chronological age reflect normative age-related processes, while changes over time to death reflect influence of mortality-related processes. These end-of-life trajectories are often referred to as terminal decline. Generally, these studies find a strong deterioration of well-being at the end of life across all types of well-being indicators, which is stronger than age-related changes. And the onset of this deterioration is about four to six years before death. Relatively few studies examine historical trends in late life well-being, but the existing evidence points to lower well-being at the end of life over historical time. Thus, at the end of their life, people nowadays report poor well-being than in earlier cohorts. The changing conditions in the years gained due to increasing life expectancies are somewhat reflected by time trends in well-being in old age and time trends in close to death populations. But there is a third perspective capturing this relation of population aging and well-being even more closely. These kind of measures are called cumulative well-being and refer to years someone can expect to have in well-being or the proportions of years in well-being. There are two contrary hypotheses. One is the compression of morbidity, where the onset of terminal diseases is delayed and so um, time spent in health gets compressed. Um, the other hypothesis is the expansion of morbidity, meaning that the longer lives are accompanied by more years of health problems. And these two hypotheses can be translated to the study of subjective well-being. Uh, life expectancy at the age of 60 and beyond varies strongly across nations and is not perfectly related to life expectancy. The highest remaining life expectancy and well-being are reported for high-income Western European and English-speaking countries. In these countries, the remaining life expectancy and well-being in, at age 60 is about 20 years um, and at very old age between three and six years. The proportion of life spent in well-being reaches levels up to 90% at age 65 for males in the United States. Regarding age trends, not only remaining life expectancy, but also life expectancy in well-being decreases with age, irrespective of the country of investigation and the well-being measure used. With regard to expected proportions of well-being, very different age profiles across countries are uncovered. For example, studies for the United States and China find that nowadays the proportion of happy life years increases. By contrast, older Europeans have lower proportions of remaining good life with increasing age. In other countries, for example, Brazil, large differences in age trajectories between men and women are reported. But selection effects may contribute to these findings because more satisfied people tend to live longer and people are more likely to drop out of service if they're in poor health or low well-being. Um, if we look at gender effects more generally, Women at the age of 60 outside of Europe and also inside of Europe live longer and experience more years in well being. But the proportion of remaining years in well being, they actually have a disadvantage. Um, within Europe, the results um, about proportions of well being um, are highly mixed and depend on age, country and well-being measure used. Only four studies have examined um, effects across time. All of these report that happy life expectancy at age 60 across time is 
increasing, um, but results are very inconclusive with respect to the time spent in poor well-being and the proportion of remaining life and well-being. So in summary, um, when controlling for cohort and period effects, normative aging is shown in stable well-being in old age, but declines in very old age. With evidence pointing to less pronounced normative aging trends in later born cohorts. Mortality related aging effects show that people closer to death report lower well being, and historical trends show that lower levels um, closer to death are found. Um, generally, more time in old age is spent in well being than in poor well being. Although life expectancies are rising, evidence of our proportions of life and well-being is inconclusive at this point. But at least for some countries, um, lower proportions of well-being in old age were found. Um, these declines in uh, well-being in very old age, um, time trends of lower well-being at the end of life, and um, the proportions of happy life years actually suggest that it is important to look at policies that go beyond mere length of life improving in aging societies. For this, studies using longitudinal panel data with multiple cohorts in different countries, including potential covariates, are essential to learn more about this important topic. Thank you very much for listening. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. You can also send us an email. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, I mean, I'm checking here if we see any kind of questions coming up. It's difficult uh, when you listen to surveys to immediately come with serious uh, questions we realize that of course Aya Nikos you're raising your hands yeah, yeah it's just great wonderful <laughs> thank you thank you Charles. thank you John for a very nice presentation it's mostly a remark rather than a question uh, have you looked or do you know the SER survey the survey of health aids in retirement in Europe because uh, yeah. you said it's very difficult to separate cohort from age effects or period effects and the SER survey because it's a longitudinal it does allow you to look at uh, period age and uh, cohort effects. And also is, is very rich in terms of uh, health satisfaction, life satisfaction, and this uh, uh, survey on the 50 plus population. So even includes the oldest old people in, in Europe, across 28 European countries. Thank you very much for this remark. Um, I know that actually methodologists are still fighting about if it's statistically even possible to um, like really separate these different effects, even if we have longitudinal panel data, um, because these effects are so intertwined. Yeah, a key, yeah, yeah, I understand. I mean, a key issue is, of course, uh, what, what is age? Yes, it, it sounds so objective, yes, but it, it isn't. Uh, is there a way to standardize um, Let's say if you have all the people with us, yes, and uh, can we somehow standardize age? I mean, we can, of course, measure when they were born, but uh, there are bio biological differences. There are, I mean, context-related differences across the world in terms of environment, health systems, uh, and, and, and so on. And we still want to, to understand whether under the same conditions, they are somehow feel better or not better. Also, I know that there is kind of a, a, a correlation between well-being and 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 measuring how uh, the age correctly, so to speak, in in a, in a sense. How how can we make systematic sense out of this complex topic? I mean, it's a big question. I know. Yeah, yeah like you said, there there are just so many in um, uh, context variables that uh, play a role, like uh, biological, physiological. Uh, socio-cultural, etc. Um, there are some um, studies that ask for people's experienced age, so how old do I feel, 
Um, but unfortunately, it's also not clear what, what do people think about when we ask them this. And the idea behind us is that we get more to this um, yeah, age variable where more context variables are included. But yeah, unfortunately, we do not really know what people think about when we ask them, how old do you feel? Um, yeah, so it is very complex. And um, I think that um, studies, including lots of different perspectives are needed. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we have no further, so far I can see further issues. Ah, yeah, yeah. Shihi, you would like to? Yes, please. Uh, yes, uh, this, is, this is a very important topic for everyone. So I'm just curious, um, is it possible to add some discussion uh, about uh, what has been done or uh, what could be done to, to make people happier in the few years before die? Yeah, um, so there, there are some studies um, on a country level. Um, healthcare is important. So um, do people have access to healthcare? How is healthcare in general? Um, so if we're looking at very old age, this is an important issue. On the um, individual level, there are things like um, generally health that are highly related, but also, um, again, subjective health. So how healthy do I feel? Um, and we know that things like um, social integration, so um, how do I rate the, um, the, um, my friendships, my um, relations with family, etc., cetera, um, that this can actually mediate um, health effects. So if I'm socially more integrated, my well-being is generally better, but it also can help me to deal with um, major life events like getting sick. Thanks. Okay, thank, thank you, thank you very much. We have, uh, this is all lots to discuss and uh, in principle, but we are short this time, of course, also. So I thank you very much, uh, Johanna, uh, for you. this nice presentation. Now we move we move on uh, to well-being, so to speak, uh, within the company, uh, earnings discrimination has interacted do a lot with also with, with happiness and, and well-being and discrimination is a big topic for uh, economists anyway. Um, now Nikos uh, Theodoropoulos of University of Cyprus will give us uh, his his insights and his insights of his colleague. Nikos. Thank you Klaus. Thank you for the floor. So this chapter is joint work with uh, John Ford from a uh, base business school at uh, City University in the UK. And the title of our chapter is Earnings Discrimination in the Workplace. Uh, specifically, we are going to examine earnings inequality between two social groups. So uh, wage gaps uh, between men and women and between whites and non-whites, say. So after the introduction of anti-discrimination legislation in the early 1960s and in the 1970s uh, across uh, the world, mainly in the US, also in Europe. The initial research uh, focus on the supply side of the labor market. In other words, it focused on workers and how worker characteristic, characteristics like qualifications or experience uh, affect the gender wage gap. Recently, and what I mean recently after the 1990s, the availability of lead and by lead, uh, the abbreviation here stands for linked employer employee data. So those linked employer employee data have enabled the researchers to observe a sample of workplaces and to observe wages and characteristics of multiple employees within those workplaces or firms. So if there is employer discrimination, then it's gonna affect uh, particular social groups through components. It could be either be between firms, wage differentials, or within firm wage differentials. So what is the between firm wage differential and what is the within? So if there is discrimination in hiring or in firing, that, that could depress wages for women or non-whites, 
if it causes to be sorted disproportionately into low wage firms. And here we can think of uh, labor market segregation where females or non whites, say blacks in the US, are segregated in low wage firms. However, there could be discrimination in wages in wage setting that could also depress relative wages if it causes women or non white to receive lower pay than observationally equivalent men or uh, whites at the same firm. And this is the within firm component. So uh, for this paper, our scope is to review the literature on the within firm component rather than the between firm component. So we're not going to examine segregation or sorting of females or ethnic minorities in workplaces, but we are going to examine the literature that examines the within firm wage inequality. So studies that use linked employer employee data estimate human capital earnings functions with firm fixed effects to isolate the part of the gender wage gap between say observationally men and women that are co-workers. In other words, they work in the same firm after removing the contribution of average wage differentials between firms. And this is what the fixed effects method does, okay? So one of the seminal studies by Bayard and co-authors in the Journal of Labor Economics studies how the road gender wage gap in the US got reduced after they account for segregation of women into lower paying occupations, industries, establishments, and even occupations within establishments. However, even controlling with, for segregation across industries, occupations, firms, and occupations within firms, there is still a 13 percentage point residual gender earnings differential, right? After controlling for all these aspects of segregation, as well as for the use of human capital controls and, and demographic characteristics. So what this second paragraph tells us that even after removing the between firm component, there is, exists a substantial within firm wage differential. Other studies across the Atlantic, for instance, from Europe, as well as from Canada, from Australia, from Japan, follow the same methodology by Bayard. For instance, I have two papers, one in 2020 and one forthcoming in 2022, as well as the other studies. Uh, we find that uh, there is indeed a residual within firm wage gap of the magnitude between 10 and 16 percentage points that includes the 13 percentage points for the US. So it means that this within firm wage inequality is very consistent across time and across countries, even continents. Similar studies of ethnic wage gaps are much less prevalent, mainly because of data restrictions. First of all, some countries prohibit from uh, reporting or they don't allow individuals to uh, declare or they, they, they don't make, make publicly uh, available uh, uh, the ethnicity or the race of the individual for identification reasons. While services that do include uh, uh, the ethnicity of the individual or the race, the numbers is, is very small. So we get uh, problems with, uh, uh, with uh, some selection basically, okay? Because numbers of ethnic minorities are very small. However, a US study by Carrington and Troske find that none of the black white wage gap in residual wages is accounted for by, by sorting into lower paying workplaces. If anything, black workers appear to be observed in high paying workplaces, right? So uh, blacks are disproportionately sorted in uh, high wage workplaces. If that was the case, you would expect them to, uh, you will expect them to observe to get high wages. However, after accounting for firm fixed effects, the within firm ethnic wage gap is about six percentage points for men. That's a penalty, right, for blacks. In other words, a black male receives a six percentage point lower wage than a white man in the same firm, in the same establishment. Whereas for women, the same difference is around three percentage points. A study for Britain by Forth, 
myself and another Gothor forthcoming in uh, this year finds that ethnic minorities tend to be overrepresented in high paying workplaces. So we find the same with the paper for the US by Clariton and Troske. And we find that uh, non-white male employees earn on average 9% less than observationally equivalent white employees after accounting for wage differences across workplaces, right? So this is the within uh, ethnicity wage differential. For females, we find the corresponding number to be equal to 7%. So an ethnic minority woman receives 7% less than a white woman in, within a workplace in the UK. So the question then is, is within workplace age inequality due to discrimination? So can we really say that this wage disadvantage for females as well as for ethnic minorities is attributed entirely to discrimination or it could be something else, okay? So a standard interpretation of these within firm wage gaps is that they indicate differential treatment of workers in wage setting on the basis of their social group. That is discrimination, right? So a white employer, if we follow Baker's theory, dislikes hiring female or ethnic minority workers, right? So as I will say later on, uh, through the process of discrimination, it could be discrimination from preferences, it could be just statistical discrimination, females and ethnic minorities receive uh, lower wages. And Nikos, Nik Nikos, sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, I see you have 14 slides, but we are still on your first slide. Uh, is this intentionally? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I'm on, the, on my fifth slide. Oh, Why okay. is that? Okay, you have to upload, you have to um, get uh, is the slideshow started. You have to click slideshow and start it because we still see your first page only. Oh. Uh, Professor Zeran, I believe uh, the slideshow has been already started, but we don't see it right now. Uh, okay. In his perspective, I think well, that let, uh, Professor okay. Nikos. Let, 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 me share, let me share a PDF file. Apologies for that. Uh, yes, once again, sharing should solve the problem. Can you see my slide now? Perfect, yes. So this is a PDF file. Can you see now? Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. Possibly the problem is that I have two monitors. Maybe this is the problem. Okay, yeah, too, 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 too tech intensive. Okay, I'm sorry. sorry. Apologies for that. No, 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 no. It's okay. So far, it's in nothing lost. I just saw you have slides and we want to see them. Okay, okay. okay. Sorry. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Lars. So uh, let me start from this slide again. So, can we really attribute the within firm wage differential to discrimination, or it could be? other explanations that also uh, create this uh, within firm wage uh, differential. So one explanation is that observed wage differences reflect differences in worker productivity. And most empirical studies do not have direct measures of worker productivity and rely on proxies. So those previous studies, because we don't really observe the exact productivity of the uh, of the worker, we, do, we cannot really say 100% that this wage within firm wage differential is attributed to discrimination because we don't observe the productivity of the worker, okay? We use proxies to observe the productivity of the worker. What will be those proxies? You name it. It could be human capital, training, and uh, so on. So a paper by Schellerstein and co-authors in the Journal of Labor Economics, 1999, addresses this issue of unobserved uh, productivity by using linked employer employee data for the US and they estimate relative marginal products for male and female employees could be compared with relative wages. And they find that women were on average 16% less productive than men, but earning 45% less than men. Ceteris paribus. Okay. So even if taking account of the individual productivity, this st study finds Still, this study still finds that, 45, that the women receive 45% less than one than comparable men, men. So this result, this result suggests that women were paid less than their marginal product relative to men. And this is consistent with the scenario in which women are discriminated in wage setting. Now, 
attempts to explain why wage outcomes may differ for equally productive male and female. So once we take, we can control for productivity, we can say that we compare equally productive male and females. So even if we, if we compare equally productive male and females, why this wage differential remains within fairness, okay? One idea, one uh, argument could be that this has to do with the bargaining process. For instance, uh, papers uh, that do experiments, in other words, experimental literature, paper by Niederle and uh, Westerlund, they look at competition and they find that women are more likely to choose time-based pay rather than performance-related pay, right? So women more, maybe they are more risk averse and they don't sort their, 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 themselves into jobs that uh, they pay by performance, but they sort the same, themselves in sort in jobs pay by, 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 by hour, okay? Or women may have worse negotiation skills. A paper by Lieberhand and the list, they do field experiments and they find that women are less willing to negotiate over wages than men. It could be other arguments, for instance, non-wage amenities, where women with young children place a higher value on working from home and avoid irregular work schedules than men do. And this is a paper in the AR by Mass and Palais. So in other words, women prefer flexible working. So again, they sort themselves like in jobs or workplaces where uh, they prefer uh, to enjoy some uh, flexible working, take care of uh, their kids, for instance. Uh, and this leads to the next argument, uh, a paper by Le Branchon, where finds that uh, women are more willing uh, to find uh, jobs within a closing distance from the place where they live in order right, to be close uh, to their family. So women will uh, forego a larger share of offered wages. In other words, they will share, uh, they, have, they will have lower job intensity or they will not accept wage offers from far away and they will prefer to uh, accept uh, job offers from uh, workplaces or firms close to where they live. So, however, arriving at, at overall estimates of the combined contribution of these four uh, arguments, in order to explain the wage gap among equally productive male and female employees is necessarily difficult because one study will have to incorporate all these arguments in order to make sure how much competition contributes to the gender wage gap, how much negotiation contributes to the, to the wage gap and so on. Furthermore, the first uh, uh, two papers by Niederlein and Westerlund and the uh, and List are experimental studies. And uh, the trouble with experimental studies is that uh, they lack external validity, okay? So it's very hard to generalize the results from these studies for the general population. So the question then is how, the, might, how discrimination might manif manifest itself. So if any discrimination within firms is a feature of firm behavior, then we need to understand the mechanisms through which it uh, survives, right? So we review evidence on wage discrimination arising in three areas of personnel practice. The first one is discrimination in wage offers on hiring. And again, there is a plentiful of all the new research, a paper by Klein and co-authors in a forthcoming in the quarterly journal of economics, finds evidence that uh, the biggest employers in the, in the US are less willing to hire women or ethnic minorities. So in these papers, they, they uh, sent a fictitious CVs, fake CVs, and then they measure the recall rate, how often a, a, a big employer in the US will give uh, phone calls back for interviews to women and minorities, right? And they find significant discrimination against females and minorities. Another is discrimination in performance evaluation. So here we can think about statistical discrimination, whereas uh, if uh, employers statistically discriminate against females and ethnic minorities, then you would expect them either not to be hired or if, to, if even to, if to be hired to uh, be given lower wages, right? So however, paper by Bochran and co-authors in the American Economic Review 
provide experimental evidence in support of tabular reduction in gender discrimination arising from updating of beliefs, right? So through time, an employer observes the true productivity of uh, workers and then can adjust his priors, right? And can correct the initial disadvantage against females or ethnic minority employees. So if females or ethnic minority employees are good workers over time and the employers can really observe the, the, the productivity, then they can, they can correct the initial disadvantage against females, against females and ethnic minority employees. However, it could be discrimination task allocation. As I said before, even if females or ethnic minorities are hired, they are not given the job or the tasks that uh, they are qualified to do, but they are mis misplaced in different jobs or tasks. And this is what is called course assignment discrimination. And paper by Ransom in Oaxaca find that women who are more likely to be employed as food clerks, for instance, stacking shelves or operate, operating cash registers, as opposed to men who are more likely to be employed as meat cutters or wrappers. So variation in job titles accounts for about 95% of the wage variation within the grocery store. However, more than that, it could be some barriers. And what do I mean by some barriers? I mean that, that there is a, that there is institutional constraints that females and ethnic minorities face within the workplace. So, so far from the available evidence, we could argue and support the hypothesis that women and ethnic minorities are victims of direct discrimination in important personal decisions that contribute to wage outcomes. But case laws and the real world experience suggest evidence of indirect discrimination, where personnel practices apply neutrally across social groups, but subtle, subtle barriers, those institutions and networks, may affect the ability of the members of a particular social group from meeting the required standards. For instance, paper by AER, by Golding in the AER 2014, finds that in many high paid jobs, wage penalties arise when employees take advantage of family related amends in the workplace. As I said before, right? Women prefer family friendly policies, for instance, prefer to work in workplaces where the workplace offers parental leave, offers part time work, or flexibility during the work day. So here we can think of compensated wage differentials, right? In order to accept those family friendly policies, women pay a wage differential out of their pocket, right? So they accept a lower wage in order to enjoy this family friendly policy. Say. So workers in these occupations who desire more flexibility, as I said, have to take this compensated wage differential. So at the end of the day, this leads to wage differentials between uh, males and females. Other institutional reasons, what we call some barriers, is the culture of long working hours, right? And uh, so one idea is to reduce uh, is uh, one element of uh, salt barriers is to break the norm of, no, 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 of long working hours. It's just men that uh, they enjoy higher wages because they put more hours of work. However, changes in information technology, which increase the substitutability of employees during the work day, offer the prospect of reducing these wage penalties. At the end of the presentation, I'm going to also spend a little bit talking about how the, the pandemic, how COVID-19 may has uh, put a, a handle on how to reduce this culture of long working hours or uh, the differences in uh, working hours between men and women. Another salt barrier could be what is called the old, old boys network, right? That men, since they are uh, the incumbent employees, they are mostly, if you prefer, in, a, in high positions within the workplace, they favor other men. And there's a paper by Kulen and Perez Trulia, uh, NBR working paper, that uh, finds uh, uses data from a large commercial bank in, in Asia. And uh, their identification strategies that uh, through a quasi random variation used by the rotation of managers. So they see how often the managers change uh, in firms. And having data on the smoking status of the mothers and the employees, they find uh, strong uh, effects of social interactions. So if you, during your lunch break or uh, if you have a break and uh, you get outside on the 
outside the, your workplace on the, on the street, and you have a cigarette with your manager, then uh, this interaction helps you to get uh, uh, faster promoted. And again, they find uh, faster promotion for men as opposed for women. Other studies uh, uh, from mainly uh, from uh, Europe, I have a, a number of studies here, the paper by Cardoso and Winter Ember for Portugal, Tate and Young again for the US, the paper by me and co-authors forthcoming in the Oxford Bulletin of Economic Statistics this year, finds that firms with more women in managerial roles ha have a smaller wage gap. So let me uh, skip this slide. I will get back to it and come to this slide and let me promote my paper. So this slide is uh, from uh, my paper where we use much employer employee data from the UK and uh, study how the share of female managers may uh, reduce the gender wage gap within the firm, right? So what we have in this graph on the vertical axis, we have the gender wage gap in low hourly wages. Right? So the vertical axis, the wage differential between the men and women in hourly wages. And on the vertical axis, we have the share of female managers in the workplace. And what do we see? We see that if the share of female managers is between zero and 10 in the workplace, the gender wage differential is about 19%, sorry, 19 log points, okay? Now, as we move along, the horizontal axis. In other words, as the share of female manager increases, we see that the gender wage gap reduces. It becomes insignificant when the share of female managers is between 50 and 60%. And it's actually zero when the share of female managers is uh, between 60 and 70%. More or less, the gender wage gap becomes, uh, th there is, Gender weight, there's weight differential in favor of women if the share of female managers is between 79 percent. So what do we see? What what is the take up? What what we can take home from this graph is that as the share of female managers increases, the gender weight gap decreases. Other evidence uh, by De Paola and Scopa from Italy, they find that female candidates are less likely to get promoted when the committee is entirely composed of males. So they have. Uh, they look at promotions from the Italian Academia for economists and chemists, and they find that female candidates are less likely to get promoted if the committee is entirely composed of males. Other papers by Norway, uh, by, for Norway by Kuzner Miller, Lucifer and Vigani and Giuliano, again find uh, that uh, higher female representation among the higher occupational ranks in the workplace, narrows the gender wage gap, and uh, so on. So I'm gonna, I'm not gonna bore you anymore with the literature. Again, it's here and it's in the paper as well. So what are what are the policy responses? As I said at the beginning of this presentation, we do not in this in this chapter in this paper we do not look we don't examine the between firm wage differential. However, we know that's important. So one policy implication, one policy response will be to reduce hiring discrimination, right? or helping job seekers from disadvantaged groups, in other words, from uh, females or, or from ethnic minority groups, to identify and access firms with more generous wage policies, right? So one policy to reduce the between firm uh, wage disadvantage is to reduce hiring discrimination. However, since in this chapter, we look at the within firm wage differential, there are other solutions, other policies, the government, or firms could implement. One is impose financial penalties on firms that are found to have used social group unfairly as criterion wage determination. So employers here could not adhere to the principle of equal pay for work of equal value, may be subject to fines. But the real world experience is that these cases are rarely put forward. Very rarely we find, we find women or ethnic minorities to, to claim uh, that they are discriminated against. And uh, in a couple of slides, I'm gonna explain why. And, and Nikos, we have to be cautious with time. We are already yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, consuming okay. a lot. So please uh, come soon to the end, okay? Okay. So, thanks. Then there is the importance of equal pay legislation. We know that equal pay legis legislation was 
introduced in the 1960s, 1970s. The gender and the ethnic pay gaps have degrees, but they are far, far from eliminated. So it could be that gender discrimination policies are not, right, are not enforced entirely, or it could be what evidence has found that the decline with the unions, the decline in the trade unions has not helped to eliminate the gender wage gap. There could be diversity training. Fair managers could be follow different training uh, courses in order to learn how the diverse workforce could be working together and be more productive. It could be the accountability measures that uh, managers should get accountable for their actions or for, for their conscious or, or a conscious by bias in causing wage differentials. As I said before, reduce some barriers, adverse the role of social connections. We talk about the old boy networks. And then uh, lately, there's a lot of research on uh, uh, public transparency. For instance, there's regulation in lots of European countries, among them Denmark and uh, in the UK, especially where firms more than 250 employees have to declare publicly their gender wage gap, right? Now I'm done with the chapter. So in terms of directions for future work, uh, one could look or uh, we can't look at, at, at what's happening to wages, hours, promotions of employees within firms and relate this to changes in gender management, segregation and aggregate wage gaps. As I saw before, as I saw you before with my finger, with my graph, uh, you see that the gender management is very important. In other words, the higher the share of male managers in the workplace, the lower the gender wage gap. So instead of wages, we could look at hours and promotions. We could also examine the, the, a correlation between gender wage discrimination or ethnicity wage discrimination and tribunal cases. For instance, you, you would expect that if females or ethnic minorities feel that they are discriminated against, then they will come forward, right? They will claim, they will claim that they are discriminated against. But these cases really, really, really appear, rarely appear, okay? So something could be the cost that to initiate those cases is very costly, or they don't have, have support, say, from trade unions or from managers in order to initiate discrimination. Another idea would be that uh, how the increase in work from home that we saw because of the pandemic has affected working hours. So any normalization of working hours between men and women due to remote working may break the attitude of long working hours. In other words, the attitude of as I said before, of a sample factor, the low working hours, and that's helped to reduce the gender wage gap. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are really out of time um, now. Just a quick question: transparency. Uh, why isn't there more transparency? This is because productivity is, is becomes more and more complex to measure. That's one reason. Or unions go down, or what? Yeah, first of all, uh, firms do not collaborate for transparency. Although they are enforced, the biggest firms, at least in the UK, some of them, they, they don't collaborate. The government does not enforce them to collaborate. Possibly they are afraid that if they are uh, going to say that the wage gap between men and female, they will, uh, uh, they will be blamed, name blame, for instance. And then, uh, again, it could be like... A, the role of trade unions is, has been, uh, the, for instance, in the UK, the share of, of workers in trade unions has declined a lot. It's less than 20% now. Uh, so either it has to be imposed, otherwise firms have to be uh, blamed, name shamed, for instance, uh, or, uh, uh, yeah. So for me, for, yeah, for me, it's, it's, uh, it has to be enforced. Up to now, it's not enforced. OK. OK, thank you, Nikos. We cannot solve the problem anyway uh, here today. Uh, let's uh, let's move on. We have two papers still coming, and we we, we, we have to overrun a bit the, se the session in time to allow the others to present. Now, the next one is Pavel Yelnov from Age and Marriage. We move down to the family, so to speak, at the end of the day. Please, um, Pavel, go ahead. Try to be, be shorter a bit, I know, I mean, yeah. Okay, I do my best to, to be concise and let me just uh, share my screen. So first of all, thank you for uh, 
attending this talk and uh, thank you also for uh, uh, giving the opportunity to write this chapter to contribute to the handbook. And my topic is age of marriage and uh, basically age of, age of first marriage is an informative and universally comparable and relevant metric and that's why uh, it is interesting for economists. Um, it has both social and economic domains. So it has, uh, it depends on social domains of gender attitudes, institutional properties of marriage, for instance, what is the difference between marriage and non-marital partition, uh, fertility rates, uh, children rights, to which extent that it's legal that children marry, for instance, uh, sex culture, like premarital sex and things like that. But it also depends on the economic domains, which are purely uh, of interest of economists, such as household structure as a production unit, uh, marriage market tightness and friction, information in the marriage market, gender specialization, uh, marriage cost opportunity. And I'm, so basically it's a topic that uh, may interest both uh, sociologists and economists. Uh, my chapter aims at exploration of the economic structure behind uh, global marriage timing uh, patterns. And uh, in particular, um, when you define a marriage uh, pattern, uh, we think about um, um, a combination, a set of uh, several um, uh, statistical and institutional uh, measurements. In particular, uh, gender specific marriage hazard rate. Um, choice between formal marriage and non-marital cohabitation, which is both institutional and uh, statistical uh, issue. Propensity of permanent celibacy, so how many people never marry actually, um, how many people never marry and uh, cohabit, or how many people never marry and don't cohabit, and spousal age gap. Um, Basically, what I'm most interested in is the evolution and transition of patterns uh, over economic development path and how uh, economic growth is related to uh, evolution and transition of marriage patterns. So the chapter is organized uh, along uh, two dimensional space. And one dimension is basically the economic theory of uh, marriage timing. And the second uh, dimension is anthropological evidence of marriage patterns. And the idea is that we can basically find uh, combinations of patterns as we see them in uh, um, data and some theoretical uh, models that can explain the structure behind these patterns. Now, uh, marriage in general, uh, you know, when we talk about marriage, we can think about two main concepts of it. And one of is of, let's say, more traditional strategic marriage, which uh, basically when marriage is a contract of great importance that uh, provides existential and social status of uh, the lineage. Uh, it would be uh, often arranged. Uh, it may involve child marriage. So this kind of marriage that you would see in let's say, broad, broadly speaking, less developed societies. And this is in a, a contradiction to the love marriage or romantic marriage, where, uh, which is more a right rather than a duty, so people don't have to marry us. And the mean age at first marriage would be usually a significantly above the minimum uh, age of marriageability in such a marriage. It is an individual choice, so it is not arranged usually. And uh, any preconditions uh, are necessary, but not sufficient, yes. So there is no strict expectation uh, to marry as soon as these conditions are met. Now, it would be a, an oversimplified statement to say that strategic marriage is uh, common in less developed societies and love marriage is you know, modern post-industrial uh, marriage in a wealthy economy. But that's not true. In fact, we see that what we call see here is a love marriage or the European marriage pattern was existing already in the Middle Ages and uh, much earlier, much before the Industrial Revolution in some countries and under some economic uh, circumstances. 
uh, that I also mentioned in the um, uh, chapter, for instance, after the Black Death, um, just as an example, after the Black Death, shortage of uh, labor uh, led, uh, led to increase in the status of women and as a result uh, to more prominent uh, romantic marriage actually in Western Europe. Um, structurally, the age at first marriage uh, is uh, combined of two components. Uh, one of them is the age of entrance into the marriage market, or let's say which age people want to marry. And the second is the duration of marital surge or friction in the marriage market. Now, uh, in order to understand uh, these two components structurally, we should uh, think about gains from marriage independently of aged marriage. Now, people intuitively uh, think that a large gain encourages people to marry early, for instance, this uh, quotation from the demography paper. However, it is not necessarily the case because increment substitution effects may have opposite signs and actually um, at the time that income effect may make people to want to earn earlier, the substitution effect may want them to you know, invest in education, for instance, and to delay the entrance to the uh, marriage market. And in addition, the surge frictions, which uh, determine the duration of marital surge, are important. And the surge frictions are not uh, trivially related to gains from marriage. So when we think about the first concept, uh, the first part of, of age of marriage, the age of entrance into the market, uh, we should think about uh, incentives to enter the marriage market. So in the, in the strategic, in the traditional strategic marriage, uh, marriage um, that would be incentives of the families. Yes, incentives of the families and um, parameters of the individual, such as the birth parity, yes, whether it's the first child or the second child or the third child, and of course, whether it's a male or female. Uh, it would also depend on the household comp composition and on constraints, such as age of marriageability in the given society, uh, either legal or socially accepted, uh, sexual maturity, so individuals, whether they uh, marry once they, uh, you know, uh, uh, sexual immature or even earlier, uh, and family resources, of course. Now, in the romantic marriage, it is actually not completely different because the marriage is still a normal good and it is still observed, even in the modern uh, uh, Western societies, that people with more resources tend to enter earlier the marriage market. However, the additional um, domains such as opportunity cost of family formation. Yes, whether it is um, actually um, not too expensive to uh, marry in terms of giving up other uh, investments such as education. And it also will depends on the information structure in the marriage market. So for instance, the Bergson and Bainoli a, a Journal of a Political Economy paper is about how uh, basically a, Uncertainty about the future income of individuals affects marriage uh, uh, strategies of entrance into the marriage market. So let's say we are uncertain about how much we or other people earn uh, at age of 30 and we are now 20 years old. So the question is whether we will enter or not the marriage market. Now the marital search, the second component of aged marriage uh, is a friction. So it, it is not predetermined. So it is not something that we can decide on uh, particularly. Uh, we can only estimate it. And then depends on marriage market tightness, such as the pool size. Yes, whether I live in a place with many uh, potential mates or only few. And uh, distributional properties of the pool of the potential mates, such as um, whether uh, it is an unequal or more equal uh, distribution of, let's say, income uh, or education or other things. So the uh, marital search is basically a dynamic programming problem with a stopping rule and uncertainty. And it depends on uh, distributional properties and uh, sex ratios and sizes of the population, and etc. And it also depends on the mechanical. Uh, 
technology of this friction. So how do we meet each other? Um, how mobile we are? Is it possible, let's say, to date somebody online or have it to travel to the place where we meet this person? So all these mechanical and uh, technological issues actually affect the uh, marital search duration. Um, so some people, uh, you know, um, uh, criticize uh, economists for dealing with search models because they say it's not economics, it's mechanics. It's something, you know, uh, not, not exactly about prices. But that's not exactly true because uh, in the search model, we have prices and the price is time. Yes, so we pay with time for a decision to stay in the market. Now, um, just uh, some um, pictures uh, to, before we conclude. Uh, so this is the aged first marriage during the second half of the 20th century in Western and non-Western countries. So the Western countries are the blue line and the non-Western countries are the red line. And we see this U-shaped phenomenon. Yes, we see that the aged first marriage decreased after the Second World War. And then uh, after the 60s and 70s, it started to increase. So this usual phenomenon is observed in both uh, Western and other countries. Uh, in Western countries, it is deeper. So the usual is deeper in both uh, decreasing and increasing portions. And it uh, suggests that uh, edge of marriage is a non-monotonic function of uh, economic development paths, uh, which basically means that uh, substitution and income effects may uh, work in different, uh, uh, first of all, in, in different directions, have opposite side, but also dominate each other differently in different periods of um, economic development um, path, yes. Now, if we decompose the Western countries into uh, groups of Western countries, such as uh, Southern Europe, uh, Western offshores, uh, which are the US, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, Northern Europe, Central Europe, we see also differences within uh, Western countries. So for instance, the blue line of the Southern Europe, you see that the bottom point of the U-shape is much later after the bottom point in, uh, in the US, yes, in Western options. Um, and also the levels are different, yes. And not only that the levels are different, but they're also differently ranked in different periods of time. So for instance, just after the Second World War, we see that the age of marriage in the US and Canada was very early, very low, relatively to other Western countries, but starting with the 1980s, it's not, not anymore true, it's the same, yes. So now Southern Europe has the lowest age of first marriage, yeah. And if you look at the most recent data, contemporary hazard rates of marriage, so these are contemporary patterns, and here are eight regions, eight world regions, and these are the hazard rate of first marriage. We see that basically we uh, experience a continuum of patterns, a continuum of patterns, and uh, each of these patterns, each of these lines is a completely different story. Like if you compare, for instance, uh, the Western and Northern Europe, this orange line, and Southern Europe, this uh, red line, you see that in the uh, early ages, like when people are in their twenties, they have a very similar um, marriage hazard rate, but then they diverge with uh, more never married in Western, in, never, in Northern Europe and less never married in Southern Europe. And similarly, you can think about uh, each of these groups of countries and you see how different they are in, in, in different periods of life in terms of hazard rate of marriage. And uh, each of these lines basically is a different model. Um, so it's very interesting to observe this continuum of patterns and to think about the reasons for uh, these differences. Uh, here, uh, this is another picture uh, that I have in the chapter, which is the distribution of countries by presence or prevalence of child marriage. So in, on this picture, you see a, a share of girls uh, married by age of 15 and share of girls married by age of 18, and the pictures are distributions of uh, the number of countries. And you can see that in many, many countries, actually, child marriage is still very prevalent with uh, some countries having more than 20% of girls married by age of 15, uh, even today, yes. And almost 80% of girls married by age of uh, 18, yes. So we 
see how uh, basically um, the child marriage is still present in the world with all its uh, consequences about you know uh, health, education, investment in children, in, you know, and uh, well-being of girls. So just uh, uh, I want to conclude this very brief, uh, you know, uh, overview of the main ideas that uh, made me to um, to organize the chapter the way I organized it. And the bottom line is that the relationship of development and aged first marriage is non-monotonic. That's the first thing. So we observe many patterns, and these patterns are also non-monotonic over time. So there is a transition between patterns and evolution of patterns, evolution and transition. And second, uh, social and economic domains of marriage have a different structure. So uh, while, you know, sociologists many times think that economists should not deal with, you know, what we call family economics, because they, they don't understand what, why, why it should be a branch of economics. But in fact, we see that social and economic uh, domains of marriage are different and they can, should be addressed with different tools and uh, with the different uh, structural um, concepts. And uh, that's it from me, from me. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you very much, Pavel. Um, I know we have no time, uh, but is there a question left quickly? If, well, I mean, how much is, is the rise in, in age, in marriage age related to female education or labor market integration of women? Is, this, is, there, is there some correlation or would, how would you see that? Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, uh, if we uh, look, for instance, at this picture, of course, this increasing portion is uh, very much correlated with a uh, female education and not only education, but also labor force participation of married women. So remove, uh, removal of marriage bars. Uh, which made basically, I mean, everything is endogenous. So removal of marriage bars made investment in education for women um, a profitable investment that uh, generated the substitution effect that uh, postponed their entrance into the marriage markets. So sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. So I think we have to rush further, and I apologize now, in particular to to Li Wang and his co-author. Uh, uh, that we are a little bit pressed at the end, but we will we will get through your talk. Uh, and it's important to have everything also recorded. So thank you very much to Pavel. And uh, I, I know, don't know, Lee, who is presenting, you or Krishna? I'm presenting. Okay, perfect. Hi. Welcome. Please, Hi. so maternity leave. So finally, we have kids. And uh, <laughs> exactly. let's, let's take care right. of them. Okay, okay, whatever. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, this is a page, this is a chapter is on uh, maternity leave uh, as a, a co-author with uh, Krishna Ragami. Uh, he is on the uh, Zoom call as well. Um, so please chime in, uh, uh, Krishna, if you see I missed anything. So what I want to briefly talk about what exactly this uh, per, uh, chapter is trying to achieve. So there are uh, already some great uh, comprehensive uh, literature reviews on this particular uh, topic. And but what we want to do here is not only try to update this existing uh, literature, but also try to present a more systematic and self-contained review of the literature, and hopefully uh, try to point out some of the findings that we think are important and a uh, policymaker should be paying attention to and also need to be highlighted. So here we don't necessarily include every possible uh, paper that have been, has been uh, um, published or uh, worked on. Uh, what we're trying to do is really highlight this uh, findings and try to reference some of the relevant empirical uh, studies with this kind of fundings. Okay, so this is what we are uh, trying to do in this particular uh, project. So this chapter has uh, the following uh, structure. So the first thing we, we, we want to do is really try to uh, go through some of the uh, policies and about the notations and also the heterogeneity across, across different countries and the dynamics over time, and also try to look at some of the determinants of the policies. The reason why we want to do this is not only try to inform people of the uh, wide variety of the uh, possible uh, policy components, but also try to look at this kind of uh, 
uh, policy components to highlight the fact that it's not necessarily easy when we're conducting empirical analysis and how we in should interpret the results. And also this kind of heterogeneity actually present a very uh, huge um, challenges to empirical analysis as well. And that's the reason why the second uh, part of this uh, prime, um, chapter actually is try to think about how this kind of uh, policy variety can uh, have some uh, challenges on the uh, identification and empirical analysis and what other things people have uh, used to address these issues. And then we will come to the empirical uh, evidence. And then finally, we want to talk about some of the lessons for policies and directions for future research. Okay. And there are many different types of policies for maternity leave and or related to maternity leave directly as well. And there are some maternity leave that's exclusive to mothers, but there are also uh, some per parental leave that can be shared by mothers. And because of that, you know, quantifying and measuring exactly how much time available for maternity leave is not necessarily uh, an easy task. So it's very important for us to look at this uh, definition and try to think about what is the maximum uh, possible uh, length for maternity leave and how that kind of uh, um, uh, length and also the components will affect the um, maternal outcomes and many other outcomes, okay? And there are huge variations uh, in terms of the uh, policy components, for example, length of leave and income support in terms of how much uh, the le level of the uh, wage replacement uh, is for uh, women when they are taking uh, maternity leave, and also whether or not those uh, leaves actually have include job uh, protection. These are three main components that are important for us to consider when we're designing a uh, maternity leave policy. And there are also lots of variations, not only across uh, countries, but also within countries. For some of the countries such as the US does not have any federal uh, program, and a lot of the programs actually depend on uh, the local initiative. And the, this kind of a difference between the national and local uh, leaves may be uh, challenging, not only uh, to, for, uh, for us to think about how we can measure the effect, but also think about what kind of variation we can actually take into account and exploit when we are trying to study the uh, impacts of maternity leave on different outcomes. And even for some of the countries, for example, like China with national uh, policy uh, for maternity leave, but we still see lots of variations across different provinces and that kind of local uh, variations are very important, especially for the type of uh, empirical analysis we would do. Another type of uh, component that is not necessarily very much emphasized is a prenatal uh, leave. Is even before the uh, birth, it actually, uh, you can you are allowed to have a certain um, period of uh, leave already, and to reduce the stress uh, before um, birth and reduce the stress uh, uh, during the pregnancy. And there are also some other type of uh, components of the uh, leave. For example, some countries even mandate uh, women uh, need to take the leave. Uh, after birth, okay? And, but there are also some of the mothers actually are not necessarily included or covered by uh, policies. For example, many of the coverage, coverage actually depends on work history. You need to work for a certain period. And also uh, many of the um, self-employed women are not necessarily covered uh, by this kind of policies. And this is a, for different countries, they have very different uh, policy in terms of these this different components. Um, also in terms of the coverages. And coming to the time, they're also very uh, different um, in terms of the timing of the policy changes and also in terms of determinants of why, why a country suddenly uh, restarted the reform and to change the benefits and generosity of those uh, policies. So these two things are very important to keep in mind when we're trying to study um, the impacts of maternity leave on the variety of outcomes that we're interested in. And let me show you some of the graph that we can see here um, is to tell you how uh, varied um, the length of the uh, leave policy is across different countries. As you can see here, US really uh, stands out as a no pay leave uh, at, at a national level. And over time, this sort of uh, graph summarized um, 
the uh, changes in the policies in terms of the duration of pay leave across different countries uh, between 1970 and 2017. And as you can see, Hungary has uh, already initiated a very uh, generous uh, policy in 1970, but, um, and it continued to be very high, but some other countries started to catch up. For example, uh, Finland uh, used to be very little, uh, but has, uh, now is ranked uh, number three uh, in the world. And that is that kind of dynamics actually uh, tells us a lot about how different countries are and have been in terms of their um, extent of the reform. And because of the variation of the policies across different countries and also the different motivations for them uh, to change their uh, policies, it poses a very uh, great uh, uh, challenges to how we can isolate the causal effect of maternity leave policies on a variety of outcomes. For example, macro level uh, not strategy was uh, really the um, early studies of these uh, issues, uh, but they suffered a, a, a problem that because the um, countries have different incentives, different uh, reasons for changing their policies that may also affect the you know, women's employment outcome and various other outcomes that we're interested in. And so it's very difficult to isolated uh, causal effect. And that's the reason why a more recent modern uh, analysis of this issue typically focus on micro level data and micro level studies. And that's the reason why knowing um, within country what kind of uh, variations exist is, is gonna pre uh, provide very important information for us to for use, for example, uh, different diff type of uh, model uh, to isolate the causal effect. And the literature has also used the regression discontinuity and regression king design. And that depending on different type of, uh, of variation, ex exogenous variation available for us to isolate the uh, causal effect. So there's no hierarchy in terms of the, which model should be preferred, but really when we're trying to in, uh, conduct an empirical, empirical analysis, what we should be focusing on is what are the possible uh, source of the uh, variations available to us. And then the third one is trying to empirical analysis, but I really wanna highlight the fourth one before I actually go into the details of empirical evidence in case we don't have uh, enough time. So, there are several things I want to talk about for lessons uh, for policies and also the directions for uh, future research. So there are, the literature is very inconclusive in, on many dimensions. And I provide many, many uh, diverse um, uh, estimates and the patterns are not necessarily very clear. And when we look reviewing the literature, but we do find very strong messages that uh, parental leave are generally very helpful and beneficial for new mothers and their children on many important dimensions that we really focus on and the policy are trying to improve, including the maternal and physical health, uh, as well as uh, children's long run outcomes. So what our stance on uh, maternal leave and uh, parental leave is, the debate should not really be whether a country should provide a leave program, but really uh, focus on how we can design a optimal program, how can we cover, uh, uh, improve the coverage of the uh, population to benefit more people. So there are several things we should uh, focus on and from the literature uh, that we have reviewed. The first thing is uh, to increase access to a leave programs. When we don't have universal coverage, when we don't have full leave take up, when some of women, even when they are eligible for policies they are, uh, to leave, they are not necessarily uh, take up the leave. And we need to think about how we can increase the access uh, to the leave program. So for example, uh, we should really think about uh, benefiting uh, more people and uh, disadvantaged individuals and families. And also we should think about how we can cover more of the population such as um, um, you know, self-employed uh, women and should make the eligibility restrictions uh, less dependent on the him employment his history, especially from our literature review is that we found some of uh, some evidence for anticipatory effects. It means that some of the women, because the uh, employment history matters, what, what they wanna do is try to work even before uh, childbirth uh, that actually um, ha can have some uh, negative impacts on, on, on health, okay? And second thing we think is very important is the benefits level. And some of the countries will have a high wage replacement level, but not necessarily have a job protection component. And that is not necessarily gonna achieve the best outcomes we would uh, hope for. So the benefits level should really 
uh, have uh, sufficiently high wage replacement levels and also should have a job, uh, uh, job protection components for the benefits um, uh, as well, okay? And uh, an important message from all those uh, uh, evidence is showing that a more generous programs are not necessarily always better. And there's all, so very long uh, um, policy duration of a leave can be harmful for women's uh, career. But in the meantime, very short leave is not gonna be sufficient uh, for women to reap the benefits of, uh, from uh, the uh, leave as well. So we really need to think about what is, what is the optimal uh, duration of leave and what is the optimal level of the racial replacement as well. And a more comprehensive leave program should really also try to think about how we can include components that involve fathers and uh, partners so that uh, really to the maternity leave program and paternity uh, parental leave programs can improve gender equality and improve the uh, social norms instead of just simply giving women more time to take care of uh, the kids that actually is going to reinforce the um, traditional social norms. And also what we found uh, in the literature is that the leave uh, the effective leave is very much dependent on many other institutional um, settings. For example, childcare policy and uh, uh, leave policies are actually often uh, interwoven with each other. And uh, the effective of the leave policy actually in some, uh, many cases depend on whether or not high quality uh, childcare policies and high quality childcare uh, centers are indeed available. Another thing we found is very uh, much needed is to study more of the impacts on, uh, of maternity leave on employers and coworkers so that we have a much better idea of uh, the cause and benefit and, uh, for different policies that need to be funded. And which is also the uh, focus of many of the uh, policy debates as well. So these are things that we think uh, people should take away uh, from our chapter. And then when we are trying to review the literature. So now let me briefly go through some of the empirical evidence available that actually you know, generated the insights or the in implications that we just talked about. So these two things highlight the uh, um, debate about the leave, maternity leave and the length of the maternity leave. So many of people advocating the maternity leave citing this potential benefits because this actually helps to balance women's work and family responsibility. It helps improve women's health and foster child development such as health, education, and their future employment, and also boosting fertility. And especially important is that uh, improving the gender equality and also changing the social norm, okay? But on the other hand, many of the uh, um, people against who are against the uh, uh, maternity leave or increasing the generosity of the program is because they are citing the uh, possible costs such as increased uh, disutility of work and uh, delaying women as uh, a return to work and uh, depreciating their human capital and which also increasing the cost of employers and affecting their coworkers and other uh, workers that who are looking for jobs, okay? So what we are trying to do here, we are gonna organize all of our empirical analysis to try to answer this kind of questions and to uh, and use different outcomes to answer this different dimensions of the debate, okay? So for the women's labor market outcome, this is the first big giant um, category of the evidence we wanna provide. What we are loosely doing here is try to organize all those outcomes in terms of the time. So we can think about there's a before birth, the pre-birth outcomes, and then right at the time of the uh, birth, so they decide whether or not they, will, they want to take the leave, and then right after the birth, whether or not they're going to return, they, whether or not they're going to work in the short run, how they're going to work, and when they return to work, whether or not they actually return to the same employer and keeping that kind of a match. Because again, what we are trying to do is see whether provide the maternity leave is, is so that they can uh, return to the same employer, retain their uh, firm specific human capital, which is not gonna generate interruptions. So the fourth outcome is trying to look at that. And the fifth outcome is trying to look at the medium and to the long run effect, okay? So this is how we organize everything. So for the first one, the pre 
uh, birth outcome, we do find uh, some anticipatory uh, effect, meaning some of the individuals, because they know they're going to have a birth, and so they're going to try to adjust the pre-leaf uh, labor supply behavior, uh, which actually can may or may or may not have uh, impacts on their uh, stress level and also the um, child health as well. And second thing is when we don't necessarily see uh, universal leave taking. Even when women who are el uh, eligible for uh, taking, they don't necessarily utilize the, all those uh, possible um, benefits available to them. And when we're looking at the short run labor market outcome, I think this is very important because this actually is exactly how we can understand not only the, the effects on the market side, but also how this is gonna affect child outcomes. Because the women's working uh, employment due, uh, right after the birth actually has, uh, is one of the main uh, determinant of the time and also the resources available uh, for kids, okay? So for the literature, we typically find very uh, mixed results. And shorter leave is not necessarily gonna uh, be working. Okay, it's not uh, sufficient. But longer leave, uh, for example, in those uh, in, in Europe, the expansion of the leave programs actually have some negative consequence on uh, women's uh, employment outcomes and making it be even more difficult for them to um, get employed. And when they uh, return to leave, we do find a, a very a significant and consistent evidence generally, uh, they return to the uh, employers and maintain their job uh, continuity. And for the last one, for the medium and to long-term labor market outcomes, and we found that even though, even though some of the uh, there could be shown some of the short-run effects, most of those effects in the long run is going to uh, disappear uh, for mo most of the uh, countries. For the maternity health, now coming back to the uh, health side, it, the evidence is uh, very inconclusive uh, as well. But we do see some of the um, uh, findings that are showing uh, positive effects on mothers' uh, health status, especially uh, mental health. And also, it, it appears that the introduction, meaning the initial rollout of the policy and reforms, can have a much larger uh, beneficial effects on maternal health and then later subsequent uh, reforms of the policies. For the trial health, I think there is a much uh, encouraging benefits, uh, evidence for beneficial effects. Uh, for example, especially this, uh, most of the beneficial effects probably are gonna uh, operate uh, through the increased breastfeeding duration because uh, the uh, maternity leave, women have to return to work is actually a uh, most cited reasons for why women stop uh, breastfeeding, which we know uh, is beneficial for uh, kids. Okay. And for a trial, the long and uh, long-term effects, we again found the initial leave policies when the country just started to have some maternity leave tend to have a much larger and positive effect on uh, trial uh, long-run outcomes. And Krishna and I have a paper looking at the US as well, and we found that um, the initial leave policies actually increase uh, kids long run effect, the long run education outcomes even by 3%. And that uh, is a very uh, large and significant effect. Okay, but for the subsequent policies, and when you prolong the leave and the results become a lot less clear and the patterns become uh, pretty mixed. Another thing about the fathers and with this kind of maternity leave policies, when they're affecting their mothers, they will they have some spillover effects on uh, fathers within the house as well, or the spouses. And we see that the maternity leave policy itself uh, does not, uh, it does have uh, some impact on fathers, making them more likely to specialize in labor market out outcomes. Um, but there's no insurance effects. When women do not work, we don't necessarily see uh, fathers work to increase their earnings to compensate for the loss of income. When we have share leave, we don't necessarily see um, men are actually taking up part of their leave. Um, they are not effective to encourage uh, fathers to uh, stay home and also chime in, in uh, household activities. But we do see a paternity leave is particularly uh, effective. And the leave program is ex exclusive to men, actually is uh, helping uh, changing and reforming um, the social status. Um, 
social norm. Okay. And for the fertility goal, we did find very uh, mixed results as well, but we do find uh, some evidence in Hungary uh, seeing that the leave policy is actually boosting fertility even for the long run. One last thing I want to talk about, I think we are running out of time, is the unintended cause at the workplace. I just want to, there has been very few uh, studies on this particular topic and probably just given the uh, paucity of the uh, data available to us, but we do find the firms are able to adjust uh, to employee absences when women are taking on their maternity, uh, maternity leave. Um, they are able to hire people, they're able to substitute and to move around reallocating the uh, labor hours. But this kind of adjustment is not necessarily frictionless and it's not necessarily easy. And what we have seen uh, from the literature is the total wage bill did increase with the new hires and also because the additional working hours that need to be uh, added to uh, other um, workers or firms. And also the share of firms opposing the pay leave uh, has increased uh, in some studies. Um, the leave policy itself and also can may, may also promote statistical discrimination against young women because who have not finished their, uh, um, their uh, reproductive um, uh, age yet. Um, so they are uh, facing some challenges when they get hired and firms may expect them to have kids and may not necessarily uh, hire those uh, younger women. And this is the, some of the unintended costs that may exist. Okay. And all this uh, evidence that I just talked about informed the policies and the implications and also the future research I uh, talked about earlier. And this is the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee, for a very impressive presentation also. So very, it looks, looks very complete, uh, this uh, chapter. Now, uh, of course, we have no, not much time on your no time, but uh, still one, uh, just to confirm my understanding. So you, you argue when it comes to uh, maternity leave uh, beyond sharing, I mean, kind of, uh, you, you, would, you would prefer, or the literature prefers, uh, uh, it's extreme cases, yes? Either the, the man or the woman should stay home. Is this what, what, how I read this? Or? Yeah, I think it, what, one thing is now some of the countries started to have, to have this uh, daddy, daddy quarters. It is that actually excludes to men. Not, in, not only maintaining the uh, uh, benefits that for women, they also added uh, additional component that actually is not affecting women's uh, entitlement to the existing leave but have to some components that are exclusive for men. And I think that is uh, very important as we have seen. Of course, there is, uh, there is a difference in terms of output. Let's, I mean, the labor market is one issue or, or society, but the, 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 the benefit for the child, for the children. It's a traditional conservative view would be the, the female has to stay home because this is more beneficial for the kids. Uh, is this a prejudice or what is the literature saying? Yeah, I think it is uh, um, somehow biased view, right? Because uh, we know maternal uh, education in many of the uh, modern side is very important for uh, kids, right? But we also see some evidence uh, when there's a prolonged uh, leave uh, program for, for women, and that can have a negative impact on ch child development. Because uh, after certain period, Child, children actually can benefit from having certain type of social interactions with other people than mothers. And that's the reason why I think it's very important to design a, a, a policy, optimal policy that actually can help uh, women to stay home with their uh, kids for a certain period of time. But after that, it can also encourage uh, women to go back to work and also encourage some outside uh, interactions for the kids as well. And I think that is going to be very important when we are thinking about uh, this impacts on uh, child development. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. This was important to to hear at the end of a uh, long uh, session. I have to apologize. Uh, we started a little bit later, but also overrun a bit. Um, uh, but it was nice to get this all complete. Um, I thank uh, everybody who is uh, who is still here, but also who was attending. Uh, and contributing to this uh, important project. And um, uh, with these remarks, I would like to close the session and to stop recording. Great.